welcome to the first in the series of Responsible Campers Association videos. Our intention in producing the series of videos is to show the camping public of New Zealand how the New Zealand Motor Caravan Association has used its influence on government and its certified self-containment program to dramatically alter the freedom camping landscape in New Zealand, often blaming non-certified self-contained campers for littering and defecation we no evidence exists to support that narrative. Well, of course, also suggesting the answer is that all campers meet the requirements of their certified self-containment program. There is considerable history available, including 1. The failure to have their self-containment program included in the Freedom Camping Act in 2011. 2. The commissioning of a model bylaw in defiance of the above failure to include the Certified Self-Containment Program. 3. Misrepresentation of the involvement and the support of the Department of Internal Affairs and DOC to that model bylaw. And the list goes on. For the most part in this first video, we'll look at detail of the years 2011 and 2012 being the years that the Freedom Camping Act was established by the then National Government and the commissioning of NZMCA's model Freedom Camping Bylaws for use by councils. The self-containment program in various forms has been around for over 50 years now. Developed by the NZMCA, it provided the club some leeway when dealing with councils and gaining permission to hold rallies on public land, and particularly public land that had no facilities such as toilets. In the 1990s, the NZMCA had the, the self-containment program accepted as a voluntary New Zealand standard, with other changes occurring in the late 90s and early 2000s, including the removal of boats from the standard. It has never been given any legal status as it fails to meet the requirements of a legal, legally enforceable standard for a number of reasons. For example, one, it has to have been developed and written with the intention of it being given legal status. Two, it has to have a regulatory authority overseeing it. A role prior to 2012, the Ministry of the Environment had held for approximately 10 years. Three, it has to have an overseeing government minister. It never has. And the list goes on. The making of the standard available to the general public several years ago actually fulfilled another obligation of a legally enforceable New Zealand standard. Of course, is a New Zealand standard a voluntary New Zealand standard meant only for use at club level? None of these things are, are required, which also explains why clubs were given free run to appoint their own testers, often referred to as SCOs or self-containment officers, and also the ability to issue certificates under that voluntary standard. As a New Zealand standard with any legal ability, that criteria would have been much more stringent and tougher. So let's roll into 2011, when the government created the Freedom Camping Act. NZMCA lobbied, and they lobbied hard, to have certified self-containment included in the bill, which ultimately failed. It is RCAI's understanding that that failure was due to three main reasons. One, it did not comply with the Freedom Camping Act which of course covered all modes of freedom campers, including tents, not just the minority group in RVs. It did not comply, two, it did not comply with the Bill of Rights Act. Outside of NZM saying its members, there was really little knowledge of certified self-containment. It was generally something the club had for its own use at club level. And as such, at club level, compliance with the Bill of Rights Act was up to them, and not that important. Three, it had not been written and developed to have any legal status, 
as it stands right now, that New Zealand standard actually has elements in it which are outside the scope of any legal New Zealand standard. But remember, at this time, the Ministry of the Environment was a regulatory authority, which raises the question, why had the Ministry of the Environment not lobbied for its inclusion in the Freedom Camping Bill? After all, it is them that are supposed to be overseeing environmental care. Following the Freedom Camping Act being passed into law, the Ministry of the Environment stood down from its role as a regulatory authority, leaving the industry to self-regulate. There has been suggestions from some older government ministers that the whole voluntary standard would have been trashed had it not been for NZMCA's need to have it for their own properties which is subject to exemptions to campground regulation and resource consent conditions, which require their members to have certified self-containment while staying at those properties, most of which have little or no facilities. Thus the reason that members must have certified self-containment to be members of that club, whether they like it or not. It also helps when lobbying government to be able to state that 92% or more recently, 100% of their members are certified as self-contained. Of course, failing to mention that it is a condition of membership. NZMCA, in defiance of its failure to have it included in the Freedom Camping Act, and the reasons for that failure, then commissioned a law firm to draft a, to draft a model Freedom Camping Bylaw for council use. Again, straight off, that raises the question of why is a private organisation, a mere club at that, commissioning model bylaws? I, for one, would really like to know that answer because of the situation that is, to my knowledge, unique in the world. But they did. And then they used their preferred partner status with local government New Zealand to have it reviewed and promoted to councils via that partnership. Several minor changes were made to it during that review. Now this is where things get a little bit interesting. As none of the re reasons from its rejection from the Freedom Camping Act had actually been addressed. Not one. So it can never gain legal status, or for that matter, be legally enforced. That continues to this day being the 15th of June, 2023. That model bylaw has a preamble to it, which has always intrigued me. It is stated the model bylaw had been developed in consultation with the Department of Internal Affairs, the Department of Conservation and Local Government New Zealand, who were generally supportive of the model bylaw. We knew all along that NZMCA had commissioned the bylaw. And when the NZMCA policy manager earlier this year accused RCAI of bringing the model bylaw, which is a key effort of the Department of Internal Affairs, stock and local government New Zealand, into disrespect, I decided to do some digging into why it was that the Department of Internal Affairs, in particular, was supporting a model bylaw that they would have known went against the intent of the Freedom Camping Act and had been injected from inclusion into the Act for those very reasons. While I was somewhat shocked by the response to RCAI's official information application from both DOC and Department of Internal Affairs, I really shouldn't have been. I really shouldn't have been. The grand total of the involvement of Department of Internal Affairs and DOC was an email trail of six emails which fulfilled my official information application relating to DOC's and Department of Internal Affairs involvement in the commissioning of that model bylaw. Concerns were raised about the model bylaw and the inclusion of references to the voluntary New Zealand standard, 
which of course were known to not comply with the Act's intent. Though, in some cases, that was manageable under other, uh, uh, under other local government legislation, i.e. the Parks and Reserve Act, and of course the issues with BOA. One of the other concerns raised was that the inclusion of references to the self-containment standard, or NZS 5465, was that it could or would create a situation the councils would then consider that they could restrict all camping under the Freedom Camping Act to campers meeting the requirements of the voluntary New Zealand standard only. Well, hello. In its final email, the Internal Affairs Policy Manager made it clear that the Internal Affairs Department would not and could not endorsed the model by law. The issues around Bill of Rights requirements is one that will ultimately be decided, probably by the High Court, with some council sharing the RCAI's opinion that certified self-containment is non-compliant with the Bill of Rights. RCAI has attempted to bankroll several cases defending the failure to be certified self-contained. But in both cases, the council's concerns have backed down, therefore preventing the establishment of a legal precedent on the matter at, at least, the district court level. In our open social media group earlier this year, the policy manager for NZMCA said that they were pushing certified self-containment back in 2012 to get to try and attempt to get councils to get away from the designated site approach that many were taking. <coughs> that statement could have had some credibility if it was not for the fact that at the same time NZMCA were making submissions to the Department of Conservation in which they were stating that if the Department was having the problems with Freedom Campers that it was almost certainly exclusively going to be non-certified self-contained campers. Of course, a program of education and possibly accreditation at that time would have been a better way to sway councils away from the designated campsite approach. But of course, that would not have served the interests of NZMCA. The only criteria available to use certified self-containment as a restriction on a right is for health reasons. However, last year RCAI did official information requests on DOC and a number of other government departments, i.e. Ministry of Health, Ministry of the Environment, Ministry of Primary Industries and MBIE, who took the lead on behalf of the other government departments, to discover just what evidence was available after 50 years' existence that certified self-containment or self-containment was actually achieving <coughs> any reduced health risks. But of course there is none, as RCAI has suspected from day one. That evidence was actually attached to RCAI City Committee submissions, but somehow got lost so were not considered by the committee. <coughs> the High Court has clarified restrictions must be an evidenced solver of issues, not just something plucked out of fresh air and held up as a problem solver, which is also a requirement of the Bill of Rights Act. <coughs> the High Court, crazily enough, in a case NZMCA brought against Marlborough District Council in 2021, clarified the council bylaws must comply with the intent of legislation. Naturally, certified self-containment clearly does not comply with the intent of the Freedom Camping Act. That High Court decision has never been appealed, so as to intent, that judgment stands. The inclusion of certified self-containment under a Freedom Camping bylaw is repugnant and non-enforceable, 
but also under other legislation until it is proven to reduce health risks to those to which the restriction has been applied. Much as NZMCA would like to suggest that their High Court case against Thames Caramandel District Council established otherwise, the only comments about rights, comments were about rights, were not the actual focus of that case. However, in the Marlborough District Council case, the intent of the the intent of the legislation was more closely examined and targeted and therefore has a superior um, being over the Thames Caramandel case as well as being obviously somewhat newer. I shall leave that here for video one. On our YouTube channel, I shall place links to the model bylaw and to our evidence that was lost at the Select Committee, but which is now hosted separately to our main submission on the parliamentary website. In the next video in the series, I expect to focus on the years 2016 to 2018 to include the hate campaign against learner bands, the agenda-driven amendments to the New Zealand standard, the 2016 Freedom Camping Situational Report by Internal Affairs, and that horrible banned vehicle list that NZMCA published everywhere around the world while continuing to certify their own members' vehicles that were on that list. I may actually have to split that period into two parts.